Hi, it's Monday, December the 12th, and I'm switching things up a little bit. Rather than wondering about uh, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, I'm going to focus on Christmas. So between now and Christmas, I am going to read Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, just the first couple of chapters. They're Christmas stories, and wonder about them. And that'll take us right up to Christmas. Between Christmas and New Year's, I think I'll look at John's Gospel and Mark's as well. They don't have Christmas stories, and yet they do have something to say about Christmas. And so I'm going to wonder about that, and I invite you to wonder with me. Um, and I'm going to begin with uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Uh, it's a lot of names. Uh, so... <laughs> So hold on and uh, and let's see what, what what comes of it. So Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Temar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Ramadabba, and Amadadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by, Rohab, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Abed, by Ruth, and Abed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Well, there you go. Yeah, I mangled a couple of names, but I didn't feel like stopping, you know, once you're on a roll. Um, so, what? <laughs> so, what? Um, well, I, I think that, that Matthew is making it very clear uh, from the outset, that it's important to know where you come from. Um, and I think it does matter. Um, you know, who are your people? Where do you come from? I, I think that that matters. Um, not that, that where you come, the, the people from which you emerge uh, necessarily shape you completely, um, but they do, they are connected to you. You carry them with you. Your ancestors are important. I think that Culture knows that. Ancient culture knows that. Modern culture knows that. We all want to know who our who our group is. Who is your tribe? Who are your who are your ancestors? Who are your grandparents? Or who are the people you hang with? Who are the people who influence you and impact you? Um, I think that Matthew recognizes that that's important. Um, a couple of flags um, raised for me on this one. Uh, I'm always a little bit suspect of um, of symmetry. <laughs> so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, we're told. And then from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Well, if you do the math as historians do, it's hard to make that work. If you look at um, Luke's, genealogy it's different uh, Luke has more generations um, now it, it's also um, possible that um, Matthew leaves some out he just sort of hits the high points all right I mean, if you were to ask me about my family I might mention a great-grandfather about whom I have a really good story uh, and I might mention um, uh, another relative of whom I have a great story, and I might skip over a generation between them because, eh, 
Frankly, I don't have a great story about Aunt Bessie. Um, so that's possible, and I'm not too worried about that. I think that Matthew also likes the symmetry of it. It might be because uh, it's easier to to learn. I mean, let's let's remember that these Gospels are shared um, at a time when we're not writing things down. So you memorize things. So if you know there are 14 generations on this from this period, followed by 14, followed by 14, it is easier to remember them because I got the first 14, I got ah, 12. I'm missing two in the middle. I know I'm missing two in the middle. Oh yeah, there they are. Right, so it becomes uh, a tool for for remembering. Um, so that's possible. I I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's possible that Matthew Matthew wants to say that history worked out mathematically balanced, as if to say Jesus was always meant to be born to Mary and Joseph at the time he was born. So from the beginning of time, it was always intended. This isn't God, this isn't God panicking. This isn't God going, oh, the people don't get it. What will I do now? Okay, I know I will become flesh and, and, and dwell among them. No, no. The, 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 the perfection is the 14, the 14, the 14. Obviously, this is a sign of a great plan. All of creation builds to this. This was always God's plan. That might be what Matthew is about. Um, and the fact is, as human beings, we love patterns. We seem to get patterns. Uh, so rather than let us try and find our own pattern, maybe Matthew throws a pattern in for us just and, and then tells us it's there so that we'll just, oh yeah, I feel better when I see a pattern. Good, now I, I accept the story and I'll settle it here in my brain and, and I'll, I'll remember it and I'll learn it. And that's great. Now, historians have played around a lot with trying to figure who's who and how. Um, we're pretty smooth, um, basically, um, from from Abraham through David, um, that's part of the story. Um, and 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 by the way, Luke's genealogy agrees with with Matthew uh, on that point. After David, Luke and Matthew don't agree. Um, so the first part we've got, we know most of those names, and most kids could recite them; they would know them, right? Um, and then. Well, then it gets interesting. So, so the way a genealogy works is you follow a family line, which makes sense. Uh, now, the Jews were um, matrilineal but patriarchal. So you were you were Jewish by by virtue of your mother. You were in the tribe because of your mother, but you belonged to your father in name. Okay. But this genealogy includes women. It doesn't just go through men. It goes through women, which is intriguing in and of itself. And then when you look at who the women are, that gets intriguing. Um, so so included in this, uh, in this genealogy is Tamar. Um, and... and, and Tamar was a well-known story. She made herself a prostitute to get justice, right? So <laughs> that's an interesting person to include uh, in your genealogy. Uh, Rahab was also a sex worker um, and a Gentile. So that's a strange person to include in your genealogy. Kind of breaks things up. And then there's Ruth. Now, we know the story of Ruth. Some of us will know the book of Ruth. Uh, but Ruth is um, is a Moabite, so she's a Gentile convert. So hard to make a genealogy through her, and yet Matthew has done that. And then I find quite interesting, and it might just be me uh, that, that jumps on this, but um, I won't get the right line here. This is where we started the divergence. Um, so after we get from Jesse, Jesse's the father of King David. And then it says... And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. It doesn't say David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. It identifies Bathsheba as the wife of Uriah. Now, there are few women in the Bible that have 
inspired so much uh, discourse and disagreement, actually. Bathsheba, who was married to Uriah, um, a very, very loyal soldier. Um, and David, well, when I grew up, we were sort of fed the story that that Bathsheba seduced David. Um, now we read the text and it seems pretty clear that David raped Bathsheba um, uh, or, 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 well, took her without consent. That's, that's rape. It doesn't necessarily have to be a violent act. He was the king. She had no power. She had no choice but to consent. Um, and, and, and in and around that, David kills her husband so that he can have her. Kills her her, her loyal husband. Kills a, a soldier who was very loyal to, to him, to David. Uh, he kills him. Um, so no matter how you read the story, it's a controversy. <laughs> um, it is not celebrated in Hebrew scripture. This is not a good thing that David did. And we're being reminded of that. We could have just glossed over it. And David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. No, no. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. All right, you've got to remember the fact. That's right. David killed him. David killed him so that he could have Bathsheba as his own. And then there was all sorts of tension. And David will pay um, for that sin. Um, it's the sin that, that he's called out on um, by, 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 by the prophet. So, like, it's it's... It's a big thing to just throw there in the middle. If you asked me for my genealogy and I had a great scandal, I probably wouldn't include it in the story. You know, ah, oh, well, of course, there was my great-great-grandfather, Bob, who was a horse thief and, uh, and killed a whole bunch of guys in a bar fight once and then they hung him. I I'm not telling you that story. It's an embarrassing story, and yet here it is. So... You wonder what Matthew's doing. I mean, he's giving us mathematical symmetry. He's telling us this is this is how David, this is how how, how Jesus comes to be born, and, and and this ties Jesus obviously to to David and and therefore to to Abraham. That's great. So we fulfill that messianic promise, and yet, if he was a member of the first century genealogical society, they'd kick him out for bad work. I think. We got men, we got women, we got Gentiles, we got Jews, we got all these people mixed in. How can that be a comprehensive genealogy that ties Jesus properly to David? He's taking all sorts of offshoots and off ramps, and it just it, it it seems very peculiar to me. And then on top of that, we include these people. Some of these people, historians will tell us, are insignificant. Never heard of them, we'll never hear about them, nobody cares. They're just, eh, nobodies. So we haven't just hit the highlighted people. So we've hit a bunch of nobodies, but we've also hit some scandalous people. Because no matter how you might feel about um, how the world uh, should or does regard sex work, uh, it's not admired in Scripture. Tamar gets some admiration for for finding justice but she does that by having to prostitute herself so that's like oh my god she's she's acted as a prostitute to get justice there's there's a um there's a tension in that um rahab is 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 a sex worker um these aren't people that you normally would include in your genealogy and yet matthew has so why that's my wondering why. Why does Matthew include these? Um, what does it have to do with Christmas, with the birth of Jesus? I mean, Matthew's gospel is a very Jewish gospel. Um, it, it's written for the Jewish reader because as we go through, there are there are references to Jewish rites that aren't explained. We just we just get them, uh, and there's this this effort to to connect. Jesus very clearly um, to David um, and, and therefore to Abraham um, because that's the expectation of the Messiah for the Jews, right? The, the Jewish Messiah will be descended from David. So 
Matthew's going to make sure that that happens. But he does it in such a peculiar way. I have I have mentioned before that that I think sometimes we miss the humor um, and, and in 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 scripture because it's just written there in plain language. There's no intonation. You can't tell. There's no sarcastic font, um, and we're not quite sure. And because it's a holy book, we read it very straight. But I wonder. I wonder if Matthew isn't um, mocking, not Jesus, but genealogy. It was a big thing, yes, um, for Jews uh, to know your people, know where you came from, absolutely. Uh, in the same way that some people today like to be able to trace themselves um, back to, well, Americans, I remember famously, you know, trace yourself back to the Mayflower, uh, original settlers. Um, so we, we like we like that. Um I can connect my family back uh, many centuries uh, into into Ireland and to parts of Ireland that I particularly like. Uh, I can also trace my family into Scotland, and I like and I'm proud of being able to do that. So you like to know where you come from, uh, and we're proud of that. I have friends who you know proudly display coats of arms. Um, I mean, they don't live in a royal house. Uh, they're not landed gentry living here in Canada. But they've got their coat of arms from, you know, their English um, ancestors. And they're very proud of that. Um, so people, Jews, were also very proud of, of where they came from. And, uh, and Romans, oh my gosh, they were very proud of that. So when there was a new Caesar or anyone of power, but, but their family line was celebrated. Of course, it usually involved a god somewhere if you were Caesar. Uh, but that was a big thing. So you had to know that Tiberius was descended from so-and-so and so-and-so and the light shone and it was a very big thing and it was oft recited. Um, it gave, um, well, it gave authority to, to, to the leader. I wonder if Matthew is mocking that. I wonder if Matthew's just making fun of that. Um, I don't know how many generations... Caesar would have gone back, but probably not 42 generations. <laughs> and I don't know if you noticed that when I was reading it, but I fell into a rhythm where I wasn't even really paying attention to the names. I was just trying to say them all. And they just sort of came off my tongue, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. Solomon the father, Rehob, Rehob the father, Abijah, Abijah the father, Asaph, Asaph the father, of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father, of Joram, and Joram the father was Isaiah, and Isaiah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Wait a minute, didn't we have two Amoses there? Wait a minute, did we get a... Was there a repeat of a name? I can't remember. There's an Asaph. Oh, no, Asaph Ahaz. I wonder whether we're making fun of the whole thing. Um, it's not a universal movie. Not everybody's seen it. Um, but um, there is a scene in the movie Tombstone. <laughs> Kurt Russell movie about, uh, about Wyatt Earp and his brothers um, in Tombstone, obviously. And there is a, there is a scene where Johnny Ringo um, tries to show up Doc Holliday in, uh, in the saloon, and he takes his gun out and he spins it around, very fancy, throwing back and forth, up and down, obviously showing great skill. He's obviously a deadly marksman. Look what he can do with his gun. Bang, bang, bang. Puts it in his holster. Doc Holliday has a reputation that exceeds that of Johnny Ringo, uh, and, and, and he watches, and then he picks up his cup for drinking and he actually duplicates the whole thing mimics it throws it around his finger back and forth back and forth and pretends to put it into his holster thus making sport of that aggressive threatening um action and wins the day in that i wonder if that's the kind of thing that matthew is doing here uh, he's making fun of genealogies. Jewish genealogies, Roman genealogies, everybody, everybody wants to hang their coat of arms on their on their wall like it like it, you know, it matters a whole lot. Um, he's mocking that. And by the way, 
there may be lots of great reasons for having your coat of arms on your wall. I'm not knocking that entirely. But I think Matthew was making fun of that. Those who take that too, too seriously. And that's a little bit satisfying for me. He mocks it because it's long, and to say it, you end up with this rhythm. He mocks it because, oh, look, it just happens to fit to 14, 14, and 14. He mocks it because he breaks the rules of genealogy. He mocks it because he includes nobodies. People are totally insignificant. You know, Caesar's genealogy is not going to include any insignificant people. Uh, he mocks it by including Gentiles and sex workers. People who are not well regarded by the community. I think he mocks it. At least that's my sense of it. So why? Why would Matthew start by mocking tradition? By making fun uh, of, of, of both Jews and Gentiles? Um, well, I, I think that he's... I think he's popping the arrogant balloon um, that exists around authority and and leadership. Caesar is great because he comes from this great line. And yet, here's Jesus. Greater than Caesar. Here's Jesus, the promised Messiah, who doesn't come from a great line i mean yes but comes by a very weird route it moves through people we've never heard of moves through people we have heard of but would rather not talk about um, comes through scandal based on that jesus should have no authority and yet jesus does and why is that because god because jesus is the begotten. Jesus is the begotten Son of God. Jesus is God's presence in the world. And no genealogy matters once you realize that. And I think about that sometimes when I want to disqualify something. You know, I, I you'll see something done wonderfully, uh, a, a charitable act, a, a compassionate, and you go, oh, yeah, but they did it wrong. You know, they did it wrong. Oh, they said the wrong thing. Now you see that. And so then we would disqualify it. I think maybe Matthew mocks that too. You don't have to have the correct genealogy to be loved by God. You don't have to come from the right family to reveal God in the world. You can be compassionate and powerful. And I'm not talking about Jesus now. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about us in the first century. I'm talking about us today. I wonder if Matthew is saying that very thing. You too can reveal God no matter what family you come from. You might be a nobody, as included in this genealogy. You might be someone not well respected by the community. There are a few of those. You might be male. You might be female. You might be anything, and yet God's light can shine through you just as it is revealed in Jesus. That love, that light can also shine through us, through you, through me. Doesn't matter whether we're highborn or not. I wonder if that's Matthew's story, that or Matthew's reason for, for, for this genealogy. Matthew is setting this up right away so that we understand that God is revealed not in the high and mighty, but very often in the insignificant, even the scandalous. God is revealed wherever we have eyes to see, wherever we have a heart to experience it. Wherever we're willing to go, however we're willing to be, God is present. Huh. Well, that's going to start sounding like a sermon if I don't stop right now. So I'm going to stop and leave it with you. So we have begun the journey toward Christmas. We have begun Matthew's Christmas story with Matthew's genealogy. After this, trust me, we get into a little action, a little bit of story. But for now, let me conclude in prayer. Let us pray. 
Loving God, we thank you for the journey toward Christmas. In the next few days, God, may may our eyes be opened and our hearts be opened. May we be opened to your revelation, to Emmanuel, to God with us, to you with us. And may our wondering help us hear your word and recognize your presence. We pray in the name of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's enough for me today, but I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow, and we'll continue with Matthew and see what happens next. I know you know, but it's going to be kind of fun to wonder about it together. So until I get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you exactly where you are and as you are, and God's love moves through you whether you're high-born, low-born, scandalous, or not even of note, God's love moves through you into the world in ways that are life-changing for you and others. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.